good, AK gang. It's your boy Angelo Kimbro, and I'm back with another reaction video. And today I'm gonna be reacting to Jeff Hardy. Incredible long-term storytelling in wrestling by Wrestling Flashback. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure to smash the like button. Also, comment down below what other videos you guys like to see. And smash that subscribe button and turn on your post notification bell so you never miss another upload. And let's get straight to the video, y'all. December 14, 2008. 12,000 fans at the HSBC Arena in Buffalo, New York go absolutely crazy for a predetermined wrestling victory. Now you might be asking, how can such a large crowd get so excited for a moment that they know is scripted? Well, what's important to understand is that this moment was the result of many layers of incredible storytelling. A 14 year plot for Jeff Hardy to reach this pinnacle in particular. And when so many of the sequence of events were really just Jeff's real life problems bleeding into his professional career, it makes- And that's the thing, bro. He was in WWE, like they said, 14 years prior to that. So 1994? And he was in a tag team that whole entire time with his brother, Matt. So for us to see him win the WWE title, especially since he was like underrated, damn near, you could say, as a singles competitor, because he's never, I mean, besides winning like the Intercontinental Championship and shit, but him winning the main title, nobody's seen it coming. for one hell of an underdog story. 14 years after his first match in WWE, at the tender age of 16, five years after he was first released from his contract due to drug issues, and one year on from being suspended again, thousands of fans in attendance came out of their seats. They were overjoyed not only to see their favorite wrestler reach the top of the mountain, but they were truly happy for Jeffrey Nero Hardy, the real life man, to realize a dream of a lifetime. Our story starts in 1994, as brothers Matt and Jeff What'd Hardy found themselves in the largest wrestling promotion in the world, the WWE. What'd I say? 1994. <laughs> the pair had come a long way since starting a trampoline wrestling promotion in their backyard. They had now hit the big time. At this juncture, the brothers were not actually signed to the WWE. Rather, they were brought in as local jobbers, or as we might call them now, enhancement talent. They were background assets of the wrestling world. The role of a jobber is to lose. Lose as in make someone else look good by letting them make quick work of you. This is the role that young Matt, and maybe a little too young Jeff, found themselves in. Jeff Hardy lied to the WWE about his age in order to get his foot in the door, a decision that he might have regretted when in his first ever match under the WWE umbrella, an underage Hardy was thrust into a matchup on the main event of Raw with one of the biggest stars in the company at the time, the bad guy, Razor Ramon. So disheartened was Jeff after the beating he received from Razor, and so intimidated by the whole system, a return to WWE did not appeal to the young man. He was, however, already booked to face the 123 kid, Sean Waltman, the following night. Jeff honored his commitment, and how grateful he must have been for doing so, as wrestling Sean refueled his faith, refocused him, and put him back on course. Perhaps it was this match that instilled that now famous Hardy resolve. Hardy would go on to job like this mostly at non-televised events for the better part of four years before officially being signed onto a contract with the WWE in 1998 where he would team up with his brother Matt as the Hardy Boys. The Hardy Boys were one of if not the most exciting tag team ever in the history of professional wrestling. Their level of acrobats and high-flying maneuvers were unseen in the WWE at the time. By the year 2000, the Hardy Boys had been full-time roster members for two years. They had achieved relative success capturing the tag titles and having the first tag team ladder match with Edge and Christian, the team's biggest rivals. But that pales in comparison to the heights they were about to reach. At SummerSlam that year, three teams, the Hardys, Edge and Christian, and the inclusion now of the Dudley Boys, competed in the match the three teams pioneered, the tables, ladders, and chairs match. The lengths the team were willing to go to entertain no one had ever seen before. Certainly on WWE television. So successful was the SummerSlam encounter, a sequel was booked for WrestleMania 17, 2001. 
It is widely accepted that the TLC match from that event, universally regarded as the best WrestleMania of all time, stole the show. Despite stiff competition from the likes of Kurt Angle, Chris Benoit, The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin, these six guys changed the face of tag team wrestling in these two matches. Through the entire length of both matches, the six men placed themselves directly in harm's way. Images of awe-inspiring, death-defying moments when Jeff performed a swanton bomb off a 20-foot ladder through two tables at SummerSlam, or when Jeff was hanging from the tag team title bouts above the ring and Edge speared him down all the way at WrestleMania 17. Or when Jeff did a swanton bomb. That spear that Edge did on Jeff at WrestleMania 17, bro. I'm gonna end up going back and watching this WrestleMania no cap because I wasn't, I wasn't even thought of when this WrestleMania happened. But that spear always, like... Amon spiked Dudley from the top of the ladder in the same match. Moments etched on many wrestling fans' minds forever. Jeff was in a fair few of those moments. Always known as an acrobatic and high-flying wrestler, Jeff in the early 2000s established himself as a risk-taker, a daredevil, a thrill-seeker. Somebody who, above anyone else, was willing to sacrifice his body in the ring. These awe-inspiring displays, his never-say-die attitude, his charismatic personality and unique look was quickly making Jeff a fan favorite. He was the outsider, the guy that never quite fitted in. He embodied the grunge spirit of the 90s and early noughties. Fans could see themselves in him, yet at the same time saw him as superhuman. Jeff was hot and the powers that be were starting to notice. It wasn't that long that a singles run was planned for Jeff. On April 12, 2001, he found himself competing for the Intercontinental Championship against the Cerebral Assassin, Triple H. Triple H had already cemented himself as a top star by that point. He was a former four-time WWE Champion and had aligned himself with Stone Cold Steve Austin, forming the two-man power trip an unbeatable heel duo who waged war on the WWE's babyfaces. He was perhaps the most hated guy in the company, and no one would have expected Jeff Hardy of all people to be able to put up a worthy challenge for the title. Triple H dominated Jeff for most of the matchup until the game, enraged with referee Tim White, pushed him to the mat. With the ref down, Matt Hardy saw an opportunity, ran to the ring and hit Triple H with a chair shot to the head. Jeff connected with the Swanton Bomb and in a huge upset, defeated Triple H to win his first singles championship in the company. The reaction from the fans was of euphoria as they couldn't believe WWE would book Jeff Hardy to take the Intercontinental title off of the all-powerful Triple H. This was the first major rub Jeff received in the company as a singles competitor. It's the upset of the decade! Jeff Hardy was just 23 years old when this occurred. The odds were stacked against Hardy with no one expecting him to win, but the story they told was phenomenal. Unfortunately though, Triple H won it back the next week on Raw, which killed much of Jeff's momentum. Now you might assume that this was a waste, but what it did was provide the first indication to the higher-ups of Jeff's potential as a single star. Jeff continued to have some single success throughout 2001, winning a couple of other mid-card belts, as well as having a short-lived rivalry with his brother Matt. But come 2002, his career had somewhat stalled. WWE didn't have any plans for him at the start of the year, and when he did come back, they had the Hardy Boys reunite only to get squashed by a debuting Brock Lesnar. Things weren't looking too good for the thrill seeker. That was until the summer of 2002, where out of nowhere came a turning point, a match that would change the direction of his career forever. Jeff was given the rare opportunity to take on the most respected man in the business for the WWE Championship. The Undertaker was already a seasoned veteran with legend status at this point. He was perhaps the most protected character of all time, hardly ever losing. He was also at one of the highest points of his career with a four-match pay-per-view winning streak, which included beating the likes of Hulk Hogan and Stone Cold Steve Austin. For Jeff to suddenly be thrust into this position, competing for the most prestigious prize in wrestling for the first time in his career was a shock for everyone, especially given that there had been no significant build-up to this point. Because of this, many fans thought he would just be asked to revert to his role that he had for much of his early career, and that was to job out and have The Undertaker destroy him. But that's not what happened. Instead, Undertaker and Jeff were given the opportunity to tell an incredible underdog story. The match went back and forth with chair shots, choke slams, and ladders. Undertaker just couldn't keep the underdog down, no matter what he did to him. It was the story of a guy who had no business landing any offense, scoring some memorable lucky shots. Jeff was even so close to retrieving the title at one point, receiving one of the most infamous commentary calls of all time from Jim Ross.
In the end, the inevitable happened, as The Undertaker walked away victorious. But that wasn't the point. The real takeaway was that Jeff had once again just positioned himself as a genuine star in the company and capable of hanging with main event players. Perhaps the most memorable moment came after the match, when a defeated Hardy called Undertaker back to the ring, proclaiming, you haven't broke me, Taker. Undertaker incensed and somewhat perplexed returned to the ring, grabbed Jeff and drew his hand back as if he was going to land Hardy with a right hook. But in that moment, Taker paused, patted Jeff on the head and raised his hand, impressed with the younger man's heart, tenacity and perseverance. The sky was now the limit for Jeff. He had received the thumbs up from one of the biggest stars of all time. All he had to do now was make sure he didn't mess up. Jeff Hardy had long sighted Hulk Hogan, the Ultimate Warrior, Sting and won Shawn Michaels as his wrestling heroes growing up. It was an altercation with the latter on Raw in early 2003 that really echoed the real life situation Jeff had found himself in, which must have hit him hard. In the months that followed his epic match with Taker, Jeff failed to capitalize and went back to being involved in some mediocre storylines. Shawn Michaels told Jeff that for him, Jeff was wasted potential, had reached a crossroads in his career and that he had to make a shift in his life in order to further his career. Jeff Jeff had to decide who Jeff Hardy really was, was going to be, and then stick with it. But this pep talk seemed to have the opposite of the intended effect, as by April of that year, Hardy had been released from his WWE contract. Jeff's in-ring performances weren't up to standard, and he began no-showing events and behaving erratically backstage. Jeff's drug use was becoming a problem. The WWE offered to send him to rehab, which he refused. He was in denial of his issues. The WWE had no choice but to let him go. Over the next several years, Jeff began working the independent scene, making appearances for Omega and Ring of Honor before going to work for upstart promotion TNA. Jeff would make appearances for TNA from 2004 through 2006. Over the course of his run in the company, he was suspended several times for no-showing events resulting in TNA also releasing him in June 2006. Jeff was becoming his own worst enemy. His rise to the top of professional wrestling was halted by him and him alone and he was now struggling to hold down a position in any company. But as ever, he wasn't going to give up easily. He set his mind to getting back in to the WWE. He watched on wanting to prove that he was the best in the world, become world champion and do it on the biggest stage. So by summer of 2006, Jeff got himself clean and was back on Monday Night Raw to confront Edge, who in Jeff's absence had become a breakout star. Once contemporaries doing battle with each other on the grandest stage of them all, Edge went on to leave Jeff in the dust, having phenomenal success as a single star, becoming WWE champion and feuding with the biggest star in the company, John Cena. Edge was having the run of his life, something Jeff could only dream of at this point, but was determined to actualize. Upon his return, Jeff was put back in the mid card, but he kept his head down and worked his way up. After briefly rekindling a partnership with his brother Matt, he went on to win the Intercontinental Championship on three separate occasions and was once again being primed for a top spot on the card as a singles competitor. Late in 2007, Jeff found himself in a feud with Triple H, the man who gave him one of the most significant moments of his early career. Only this time, it didn't seem as one sided. Now, Triple H was still the overwhelming favorite, but over the years, Jeff had proven himself to be a much more worthy competitor and gained immense popularity from the fans. The two were pitted against each other at that year's Armageddon in a match to determine the number one contender for the WWE Championship. Jeff was walking into the match as Intercontinental Champion, the championship he won from Triple H in that huge upset back in 2001. The question on everyone's mind, however, was could Hardy, still the underdog in the contest, upset the game again? After a hard-fought back-and-forth contest, Hardy managed to reverse a pedigree attempt into a pinning combat combination and once again stole a win right from under Triple H's nose. Want to make more money when you sell your home? Redfin agents sell for more than other agents and you'll be saving thousands with our 1% under Triple H's nose. Finally, April 1st, 2009, since the infamous ladder match with The Undertaker nearly six years prior, Jeff had a shot at the WWE Championship. This time, it wouldn't be a legend like Triple H or The Undertaker he'd be taking on. It would be a legend killer, one Randy Orton. When the day of the Royal Rumble 2008 arrived, Jeff was walking in as Intercontinental Champion. If he were to walk out with the WWE title too, he would hold both belts concurrently, a feat nobody had accomplished since his childhood hero, The Ultimate Warrior, had defeated Hulk Hogan in the main event of WrestleMania VI. Sure 
Surely at this point, the stars were aligning for Hardy. He had all the momentum going in. The crowd in Madison Square Garden were behind him. Could he go out there, vanquish the Viper, and walk in the footsteps of his childhood hero? Unfortunately not. Despite Jeff's valiant effort, the Apex Predator gained the upper hand and hit Jeff with the RKO for the three. Jeff, despite the loss, was again proving himself as a major player. The WWE weren't blind to it either and decided to pull the trigger. Not long after, he achieved a huge victory against his childhood hero, Shawn Michaels. The man who gave him that reality check five years prior. Jeff was finally starting to prove his star potential. At WrestleMania 24, Jeff was slated to win the Money in the Bank ladder match. With the Money in the Bank contract, a superstar can cash in for a championship opportunity whenever and wherever they like. On every occasion before this, the winner of the Money in the Bank would go on to become world champion. The WWE knew they had a man the audience loved, and he was ready. He'd done it. He'd worked his way back from the brink. He was going to finally win the big one. The sky was the limit for him. All Jeff had to do was not mess up. On March 11, 2008, Jeff was suspended for 60 days for his second violation of WWE's wellness policy. He was removed from the Money in the Bank ladder match and prematurely dropped the Intercontinental Championship to Chris Jericho. This time though, the WWE didn't give up on Jeff so fast and he soon found himself back in the title picture. He would face Triple H one-on-one -on -one for the gold twice in 2008. Both unsuccessful attempts, no upset wins this time, but he was knocking on the door and it was only a matter of time. In the following weeks, he gained momentum defeating The Undertaker, the man he lost to in his first ever WWE title match six years prior in poetic fashion. Following this, he was booked in a triple threat match at Survivor Series. Triple H versus Jeff Hardy versus that month's hot new foreign menace, Vladimir Kozlov. However, Jeff was pulled from the match on the night. Jeff had been attacked and left unable to compete with his old foe Edge returning and taking his place and subsequently winning the belt. Jeff once again had to watch on as it was the rated R superstar who was on top again. But despite this minor setback, it seemed like the stage was finally set for Jeff Hardy. Edge, Triple H and Jeff were booked to go one on one on one at the final pay-per-view of 2008, Armageddon, with the WWE Championship on the line. Edge and Jeff had made their names off each other through their tag team exploits almost a decade prior and were the two breakout stars of their groups. Jeff had made his WWE return to confront Edge when Edge had just defeated John Cena to become champion himself. Edge, who had stolen Jeff's place in the triple threat match, won the belt that should have been his and alongside him it was Triple H, who Jeff had beaten to win his first singles gold back in 2001. Triple H, who Jeff had defeated to get his shot at the title against Randy Orton at the exact same event the year before. Triple H that stood in the way of him and the WWE Championship for the better part of a full calendar year. Could Jeff defeat both Edge and Triple H? Could Jeff overcome those odds? Well, the last minute of the match seemed like it was going to be a familiar sight for many fans. The three men had just gone back and forth taking advantage over the others and it was obvious that the end of the match was near. As Jeff Hardy got into the position of the top turnbuckle to hit his finishing move on Edge, Triple H flew in to knock him off his feet. The game then managed to hit a devastating pedigree on the WWE Champion. Everyone thought he was about to win the title for a record-breaking 13th time as he covered Edge for the pin. That is until Hardy managed to recover on the top turnbuckle and landed a perfect swanton bomb on Edge, breaking up the pin and knocking Triple H out of the ring in the process. Fans were already losing their minds as Hardy was able to pin the champion. One, two, Three, allowing him to secure the victory and the WWE Championship. As Jeff falls to the ground in celebration, you can see it's likely that Jeff wasn't doing very much acting here, as the real life man had overcome so many obstacles and personal demons to reach such a pinnacle moment in his career. Sometimes in professional wrestling, the best storylines are not the ones that pay out exactly by the script from start to finish. If there is even such a thing, no. Many great moments in the history of WWE have come as a result of having very blurry lines between a superstar's fictional characters development and their own personal real life drama. After all these years, Jeff had done it. He had climbed the mountain and stood atop it as the WWE Champion. He had accomplished what he and his brother could only have dreamed of when resting in their back garden. He wasn't wasted potential. He had worked his way back to the big leagues and in poetic fashion had defeated these two men with whom he shared so much history with. He had bounced back bigger and better than ever. It was a joyous celebration. Jim Ross on commentary with another iconic call just as he did over six years prior when Jeff had nearly won the first time. There was an electric atmosphere in New York that night. The fans had always stood by Jeff Hardy. He was their champion. He was our champion and we couldn't have been happier for him. I'm a fighter pilot. Alright, I 
AK game. That was the end of the video. Yeah, man. When we found when, when Jeff Hardy won the title, like we said, he got suspended and all this other multiple times and all that other stuff. Like seeing him get suspended for us wrestling fans, especially for us Jeff Hardy fans in general. Like it really hurt because Jeff Hardy is one of them. Like we was trying to hit the swan time bomb. <laughs> We was trying to hit the Swanton bomb on our bed and shit. We was trying to hit the the um the twist of fate and everything. And so to see him go through that was very upsetting, man. But then to see him win the title was also like it it was something different. Um but that's the end of this video. If you guys enjoyed it, make sure to smash the like button. Also, comment down below what other videos you guys would like to see. And smash that subscribe button. And turn on your post notification bell so you never miss another upload. And I'll see y'all in my next video. I'm out.